Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's July 6, 2013 meeting. And if you would please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. June, June 6. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Probably corrected. This is the June 6 meeting. Um, <clears throat> do note that the commission meeting uh, is being live streamed on their uh, NCPC website. We do have a quorum, and we will proceed uh, as the agenda has been publicly advertised. And agenda item number one is the report of the chairman. Pursuant to delegations of authority adopted by the commission, I've approved two transfers of jurisdiction, and those are at your desk. The first is for lands at Washington Avenue and 2nd Street Southwest to facilitate the American Veterans Disabled of Life Memorial Project. Uh, the transfers of jurisdiction will transfer um, just over 2,700 square feet of land from the National Park Service to the District of Columbia for highway, for proposed highway, and 4,800 square feet of land from the district to the National Park Service for park uses. Second, there's a two and a half acre portion of the Potomac Riverbed at Ronald Reagan uh, Washington National Airport from the National Park Service to the Federal Aviation Administration for airport safety enhancements. Uh, any questions on those two items? Again, they're at your desk. Um, agenda item number two is the report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, on June 11th, uh, NCPC will host a public meeting to present the comprehensive plans draft uh, for admissions and international organization element. Also, as part of that presentation, uh, Cheryl Kroll from the Cultural Tourism DC will uh, discuss how their organization engages the diplomatic communities to promote uh, cultural tourism events. Also, as part of the first phase of our height master plan, uh, NCPC and the district's uh, office of planning held three public outreach meetings over the past month, and we'll hold our final meeting tonight at Savoy School in Southeast Washington. Uh, we had very good turnout at the meetings, uh, and we had very engaging discussions uh, with the participants. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the commission, uh, meeting, right, uh, attend three meetings already, uh, to, <laughs> uh, for their attendance at, at the meeting. I think they've heard a lot of uh, uh, good discussions, and I think that actually helps uh, prepare us for uh, the upcoming uh, next subsequent phases of this study. We also plan to brief the commission on the status of the project, and at the closeout of phase one at your next meeting. Also on uh, May 3rd, the Potomac chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects recognized the Southwest Eco District Plan uh, with its uh, 2013 Honor Award uh, for Outstanding Professional Achievement. Also last night, uh, the Committee of 100 presented its Vision Award to NCPC also for the Southwest Eco District Plan. So I'd like to acknowledge the good work of uh, Beth Miller, uh, Diane Sullivan, and the staff, and also to the Commission uh, for your great work on this uh, initiative. Uh, it's summertime, so we have um, new interns that have uh, joined us for um, uh, coming months. So I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first, we have Andrew Peng. Andrew, you stand up. Andrew's a rising senior at Tufts University, uh, and he's working in our Office of Public Engagement. He's majoring in Sociology and Environmental Studies, and he's also serving as, uh, and serving as an Executive Board Media Manager for uh, Tufts Sustainability Collective. Uh, we also have Annalie Galeas. Okay. <clears throat> Annalie is a second year urban planning student at the University of Maryland, and she's joining our uh, research and policy division. She has a sub substantial amount of experience in geography, uh, receiving her bachelor's degree in geography, and also performing GIS assistance to the uh, U.S. Census Bureau and Rails to Trails Conservancy. We also have Justin Hyde. Uh, Justin uh, joined our physical planning division as a summer intern. Uh, he's working towards his Master of Landscape Architecture degree from Rutgers University. He also holds a Bachelor of Science in Plant Science, a uh, Bachelor of Science in Plant Science, and Landscape Management uh, from the University of Maryland, and also be working with us over the summer. Uh, we also have uh, two personnel announcements. Uh, first of all, after 15 years at the Commission, uh, Physical Planning Division Director Bill Dowd left NCPC to become GSA's Project Executive for the Federal Triangle South Project. So Bill's here. <laughs> All right. He's not an intern. So. Uh, but of, of course, he's uh, led a lot of very important and very high-profile projects for this agency 
including the urban design and security plan, Pennsylvania Avenue, and the President's Park redesign, uh, the DC Circulator, Monumental Core Framework Plan, and of course the Southwest Eco District. And uh, while we are going to miss is a good humor, commitment to excellence, and professionalism, we also look forward to our new partnership as he assumes his role as GSA. And also congratulations to Bill for adopting his uh, new daughter, Victoria, uh, last, uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> and finally, uh, Elizabeth Miller, who has been acting as the uh, division director, officially was appointed to that position um, a few weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> Prior to uh, joining the commission in 2001, uh, she was a principal planner for West Palm Beach's County uh, Planning and Zoning Department. And she's also served as a project uh, manager for the Urban Design and Security Plan, Monumental Core Framework Plan, and the Southwest Eco District Initiative. So congratulations to you, Beth. So that uh, concludes my presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Acosta. We welcome the interns. Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, this summer. And to Bill and Elizabeth, congratulations. Uh, Bill, in your new post, we look forward to continuing to work with you, especially on things like the Southwest Echo District, where uh, the transition will be seamless, um, <clears throat> I'm sure. Um, yes. Please. Um, I would just like to take a moment on behalf of the District of Columbia to acknowledge um, how, uh, what a pleasure it's been to work with Bill Dowd over the last several years and uh, uh, how much we appreciate his uh, his uh, professionalism, his patience, um, his doggedness, his good humor, um, all really wonderful qualities. And uh, we're going to miss him, I think, very much at the commission. I, I, we're, we are excited for him in his new role, but uh, at least on behalf of the district, we, uh, we certainly are going to uh, uh, you know, miss seeing him around uh, here at NCPC. And it, and it has been a pleasure, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Um, that ends, you have anything else? No. And agenda item number three is the legislative update in uh, Ms. Schuyler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two items to report. The first is one you, which you in fact brought to my attention. Uh, it's a pending bill, uh, HR 2209, which would establish um, military management of military cemeteries. The implication for the commission is we do see things plans, projects for Arlington Cemetery. Well, we know that the current director is retiring, so it's possible we will be seeing a military person at our next, some point in the future to testify for that, for any military projects at the cemetery. The second is an item that directly relates to something that's in your packet that was sent out to you. Um, it's, uh, if you recall a few months ago, I reported on HR 588, which was a bill that proposed um, a, an exception to the uh, prohibition against donor recognition um, in the Commemorative Works Act to uh, allow a donor plaque at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Center. Um, that passed the House, was submitted to the Senate, and just Monday the Senate passed its version of this bill, which in fact um, authorizes commemorative works beyond just the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, but across the board, subject to the proviso that they be inside a structure. Um, and it establishes review criteria for the uh, Secretary of the Department of Interior by which these will be evaluated as being appropriate. Um, I call that to your attention because at the time the uh, memo was written, this bill had not progressed in the Senate. What is expected, um, talking with the OMB uh, legislative expert this, after, this morning, was that it'll go back to the House and the House will simply pass a resolution adopting the Senate version. If, in fact, that's a correct assessment, this will become the approach for donor recognition in the future for all commemorative works. Um, if, in relation to this report, you have any comments or thoughts relative to both the report and the memorandum and wanted to bring, bring it up now, Ms. Kemp, who was the, um, our commemorative work expert, is available for questions or for comments. Do you want to have any thoughts, Ms. Wright? Um, um, I would just, there's a part of the bill that doesn't make sense to me. 
um, and that is that it stipulates donor walls can only be on the inside of a building. And, and um, for people who are it, um, doing landscapes, memorials, etc., that will um, instead, it would be an incentive, it seems to me, to include a building in a park setting or a, even a cemetery. I mean, if you're trying to raise money. I, I raised this issue um, at some meeting. Mm -hmm. I can't remember when. Um, because as a former curator, you know, it's hard to raise money. Um, and we're tying the hands of, of, of people who um, need to give something just uh, something beyond um, the altruistic feel-good thing to their donors who are, are being asked for millions of dollars. However, um, so I think it's important. I believe that the design process and design review process could um, mitigate um, unfavorable outcomes, LED signs and stuff like that, and, and big tacky things. Um, <clears throat> but I think the bill goes too far in trying to, I, I get that what I think is the motive, and that is to um, make uh, sure that that the donor wall doesn't take over the the um, whatever it is. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that's the appropriate way to do it. And I think it might have an un the unintended consequence of making people feel like they need to include a building so that they can acknowledge um, their donors, and then we're going to have some really lovely <laughs> bathrooms and bookstores and and smoking shacks and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's all I have to say about that. I, I think it's worth noting that the bill came, OMB clears bills through affected agencies to ensure that there is a unified executive position. Regrettably, in this case, OMB had no prior notice until after it passed. We were not afforded, NCPC was not afforded any, op any opportunity to discuss this with the Hill pre and OMB pre-passage. We have, I think it's fair to say, and Marcel or Lucy chime in, we have a number of concerns about the bill that passed. Um, but unfortunately, the opportunity to provide the comments we might have liked to provide was not there. However, having said that, we have heard what you said. And as we move forward with, I think, looking into this, as that memo suggests in your package, it may not be too late in the development of the Commission's policy to move in a, a direction that you feel is more appropriate. So as I understand it, the House has acceded to the Senate's position? Not that, yet, but that, that is that is what is expected, but no guarantees. They don't think they'll introduce a new bill or try to amend any bill, because the House <coughs> position on this particular, the House position when they with HR 88 is they wanted donor recognition for the Vietnam Memorial, and they wanted it fast. So I don't think both OMB and myself don't think that they'll undertake any sort of action like amendments would then have to go back to the Senate or that they'll just accept the Senate version as it will meet their House objective. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Two things. First, uh, on this subject, uh, I just almost want to just say I think this is a slippery slope. And I think we, those of us who've been involved in this for a while, realize it's always been a, a somewhat of a, a an honor that folk didn't want to have themselves associated, but we're glad to give and help. But once you start this, not only will it, I think, create buildings, it's going to create monuments. <laughs> People are going to say, "Wow, my family's special. We want to, we can get it going. We'll put a new monument down there so we can get our name on it." And I don't know what it'll end up being. At some point, we may have a height problem with it. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's really a, slip, it's a slippery slope, and uh, I just I don't think we can push back at the powerful hill, but I just think it's really going to open up a real dangerous situation, and people ought to be giving because they want, not because they want to be recognized. Um, and I also find that it's always, uh, always amazes me now that the Vietnam uh, uh, War Memorial, a lot of my classmates from the academy died in, that, in the war and on the wall. Well, thank God I, for whatever reason, wasn't. I'm not on a wall yet. But um, 
they got a great constituency group. Mm -hmm. And they've been working it. They are people who are, have resources and are, are still around and alive. And they, all they have to do is crank up the list, the, the, the listserv, and say, you know, we got something for you guys to remember you. And the answer is yes. And they take those yes lists up to the hill to any congressman who wants some attention or wants to do something proper, I guess. And they can get them to buy into almost anything. Mm -hmm. And there will be more groups that will follow for other reasons. But it's troublesome. It's a slippery slope. Anyhow, but, uh, that's just one voice from Anacostia. <laughs> uh, the last thing is Anacostia Cemetery. Um, as you all might know, on the uh, Homeland Security grounds, the West Campus, there's a very historical cemetery. And to date, uh, at least other than some community support, it's, been, it's being maintained by the, city, by the government, but uh, recognition of those soldiers has not been, I mean, they don't get flags on them, mm -hmm. I don't think, on Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. So I think if there's a way we can get, uh, we're trying now to work with the Joint Base uh, Anacostia Bolding, uh, Homeland Security and the community to try to set up a, a, a vehicle for kids really to be involved. This can make, get them on that campus and get them to know what's going on. But there ought to be something a little more formal done, I think, to try to maybe umbrella them into the Arlington Cemetery because it's the oldest and probably the first integrated cemetery in, in, the, in the country. Uh, so anyhow, that's the, just something maybe can be carried back. Well, I think we will research uh, the Senate uh, bill more and monitor this and see how we might be able to, to weigh in. This might be appropriate. Uh, Ms. Kim, did you have additional? Not unless okay. there are any questions. Mr. Miller. Um, could you, <clears throat> I don't think it was in our pack, could you provide us, send us a copy of the Senate uh, version? We had the House. Uh, I'm sorry. The, no, we, it, what I was referring to that was in your pack, it was the memo on, yeah. but we can definitely get this. this. We can get it, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, uh, I'd like to say a couple things that I hope would add, uh, offer some comfort to the commission of members of the commission are concerned about what this might result in. One of the provisions, uh, one of the requirements here is that it, uh, whatever is done for donor recognition has to be has to com uh, conform to applicable applicable National Park Service or General Services Administration guidelines for donor recognition as applicable. I don't, I can't speak to anything on, on the GSA side of. Donor recognition, but uh, you know, typically these things wind up in Park Service hands anyway. Um, we uh, do have very strict guidelines for donor recognition. We have time limits and we have dollar values that are associated with them. And you can't, um, you're not going to get your name on a wall for you know a ten thousand dollar donation to a memorial. It's uh, I don't know what the exact guidelines are, but we already have adopted special guidelines for the National Mall, um, and and and. A, this is actually um, one of the really good things about the, uh, uh, the, the bill is that it, it does require that these, all of these things be consistent. And previously they were not consistent. So we were having regular discussions with oh. memorial proponents who could look at our policy for donor recognition and other areas of the mall if somebody donates to you know, fix up some other facilities or, or what have you for us. Um, they could be um, recognized in those circumstances, but they can't re be recognized for um, donating to a memorial. So uh, the uh, we're, it would only be for high dollar um, value. I think it's it's it may be a million dollars or more. I don't recall the exact number, but it's very high dollar that that actually warrants recognition on site. Um, and the fact that it could be inside of a structure. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that's, I believe that's also consistent with the current guidelines, but uh, those guidelines could also be amended, particularly with the advice of this commission, in terms of how we might want to try to control that better um, and, and create circumstances where we're not um, encouraging large facilities uh, built in conjunction with memorials. I mean, things like that only should be built when there is a, de a definite need for, um, you know, shelter for uh, a ranger who has to be on site or uh, uh, restrooms when they're needed or, you know, those sorts of things. And we have definite circumstances where that need has been demonstrated. So. Mr. Hartman. Can you elaborate a little bit on the time limitations that uh, were part of this? Uh, yeah, I believe that our 
time li limit on the mall is that every it's it's time limited by I think to ten years. Ten years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that you know that again it's a matter of policy that gets adopted by the by the Park Service. So. Um, you know, but in any case, we that's generally consistent with the national guidelines because we do allow some donor recognition for other facilities across the country. Uh, and actually, Washington was something of an anomaly because the Commemorative Works Act essentially prevents that. I mean, if you gave a lot of money to uh, fixing, uh, to establishing, for example, Georgetown Waterfront Park, we could not put your name on that mm -hmm. um, in the same manner that we could in other parks um, because of the the donor recognition policy um, and the Remembered <coughs> Works Act being in theoretical conflict. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to just uh, add about the slippery slope and a, a phrase that's used in some communities called cream. Cash rules every action made. <laughs> And we have seen this in public and politics the last few years. A million dollars is chump change when people can drop 500 million at a, at a, on a roll. So, you know, we got to really be thinking about it. I'm sure we can't stop it because it's, ca it's cream, right? But it's really going to, I, I'm, I, I, was, I was always proud that we didn't get donors to be recognized because I thought it was a good thing, but I think that's going to move on. Do, Thank you. Do you have a list? And, of and by the way, and by the way, uh, there's no agency within the federal government of the United States that is immune from congressional modification. Mm -hmm. I don't care what kind of regulation you got. So don't, don't take that to the bank, okay? Uh, maybe not to the bank. That's the wrong way to put it. <laughs> do, do you know some of those $500 million guys? Because I, I, I know well, some people I who might they, want to talk to them. I think they're referred to as the one percenters. You can probably get that from a lot of different yeah. editorial docu documents. <laughs> I'll go to Macau where I was about six months ago. And you can hook right up with one of them. <laughs> moving, moving right along. Mm. Um, I just wanted to thank Peter for the um, comments about being applicable rules and how they're applied. And I think if we could in some way, Mr. Chairman, as you said, if we can add comments maybe in an informal way, but to encourage people to think about other ways to recognize donors that don't require on-site recognition. And I think... Um, the staff has given us some of those ideas in previous uh, presentations. And I think that if you look across the country, that's being done more and more. Um, I know I face this question all the time in the work that we do in trying to recognize donors properly but not have it overtake the site. And there's just so much opportunity for virtual recognition on websites or with little barcodes. And, you know, I think there's a a really good way to do that and reach that balance. So as much as we can encourage that and, and share those examples, the better. Um, our, our donor policies, uh, both nationally and for the mall, have um, guidelines to reflect that. And there are certain things that could be done at certain dollar levels, you know, names on brochures or recognition on the day of, of, a, of an opening or things like that that all correspond to certain dollar levels. So we, we're, we're attuned to that as well. But I'm, I do want to make whatever we do consistent with what the commission would like to see. So um, we'll be working on that. We can reinforce that for you. Right. We'll work with council and staff to see how we might uh, appropriately weigh in at this point. Okay. Agenda item number four is the consent calendar. There's only one item on it, and that is the bachelor's enlisted quarters and enlisted dining facility at Marine Corps Base Quantico. Um, any questions on that particular project? Hearing none, all in favor of the one item on the consent calendar say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's approved. Um, <clears throat> we're nearing the end of our meeting. Um, agenda item number 5A is the comprehensive plan for the national capital, um, federal elements, uh, amendments to the work, to the federal workplace element. We have Mr. Zayden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, members of the commission. Um, this is your first and only action item for the day, so it's my pleasure to present that. This is the, um, uh, the continuing work in updating our comprehensive plan or the federal elements of the comprehensive plan. And this particular element is the workplace element, and we're requesting final adoption of the policies 
and the word final needs to be qualified, which I'll, I'll, I'll do in my presentation. But this uh, was out for draft in 2011, uh, and we've been working since that time to update data, uh, revise the policies, and uh, restructure the element because this is really the biggest element uh, within the comprehensive plan, and, and uh, we're doing a lot of work to refocus it and reorganize it. So. Um, just to update the Commission on where we are, we're, we're, we're moving through our update of all the elements. The transportation and environment element has been, have been finaled. Um, the urban design and historic preservation element have been released as drafts, and um, we're still working to revise those. We're waiting for some other uh, projects to work itself out, including the height study. Um, the visitors element was released for draft uh, earlier this year. That comment period has closed, and all of these elements do go out for a 60-day public comment period. So. Um, but the, the comment period for the visitors element has been closed and we're working to revise that and hoping to bring that back to the Commission as a final uh, later on in the summer or early fall. <clears throat> the foreign missions element uh, is out for public comment now. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, that data is wrong. It was, it was released in May. And there is a public meeting, which you heard uh, uh, Mar Marcel Acosta mention, um, next t Tuesday, the 11th, uh, to do a public meeting on the foreign missions element. And, and we hope some good attendance for that. Um, and then we're looking to bring that element, uh, revised element, back to the Commission in the fall for a final adoption. And then the workplace element is before you today. The only element that we have not um, touched yet is the open space and parks element, and that is something we're looking to get into this summer and hopefully bring that to the Commission not long after. So we're, we're, we're moving along. So to talk about the workplace element, this was last updated in 2004, which was when the full comprehensive plan was last updated. Uh, the element provides policies and data on locating and managing federal facilities and the federal workforce throughout the National Capital Region. And as I said, it's a very, very, very broad element, and we're really looking to reorganize it and refocus it to reflect a lot of the current trends that are happening in the federal workplace, because since 2004, there has been a, a lot of work um, and a lot of uh, direction provided from the federal government on how federal workplaces should be located and managed. And, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, from the data side, the comprehensive plan does provide data to illustrate trends on certain subjects. And in the workplace element, this is where we get into federal employment. And in this update, we've used a new and improved approach to gathering federal employment data. We are gathering federal employment data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And uh, in previous comp plans, the federal employment was put out and it did not include secure agencies or the Postal Service. Under this approach, we are covering everybody but the Postal Service. So it's quite a challenge to get this information in, in a comprehensive way and we think we're getting, we're getting better at it. But to talk about the trends, um, this is the, the federal employment uh, trend since 1990 up until 2011. And the high point of federal employment in the National Capital Region was in 1993 where we had about 478,000 federal employees. The low point was in 2001, where we had about uh, 403,000 employees. And up till 2011, we're estimating approximately uh, 452,000 uh, federal employees. So it's an interesting trend to see how the federal uh, workforce has grown within the region. What's more telling is the proportion to federal or I'm sorry, employment in, in general in the national capital region. Um, the federal government is still the biggest em employer, and of course there's spin-off effects from federal employment, but if you look at 1990, the uh, federal government comprised almost 18 percent of the regional workforce. That has decreased over the years, um, and in 2011, it's about 13 percent, and there are numerous, numerous explanations for this. One is the, the shifting to um, some federal services to consulting, and also the diversification of the regional uh, economy. Um, so the federal government is still a big player, but its proportion has changed within the National Capital Region. Okay, so looking at new policies and plans since 2004, and as I mentioned, how federal workplaces are located, operated, and managed has changed dramatically uh, since the last comprehensive plan update. Um, significant changes in federal workplace policy have come from Executive Order 13514, which we all know is the Sustainability Executive Order. As a follow-up to that, the Council on Environmental Quality issued uh, the Sustainable Locations for Federal Facilities policies, which really gave some more specific recommendations and policies on how federal facilities should be located and really focused on transit. That was a very important piece of that and something we've carried over into the, the comp plan. There have also been various laws and directives to promote telework, consolidate federal space, and 
uh, what's called freezing the federal footprint, which is really trying to reduce um, the, the federal government's uh, space needs and make better utilization of federal space to uh, realize um, those economies. Um, when it comes to planning initiatives, there have been uh, some parallel uh, planning initiatives that have been released. The Monumental Core Framework Plan, uh, which was released by NCPC, looks at um, it revitalizing and connecting the downtown core, which is where a lot of the federal office space uh, and federally owned space is located. Uh, COGS Region Forward Initiative, which focuses on regional activity nodes, but those that are located close to transit, which is an important piece. And also the District of Columbia Center City Action Agenda, which lays out an expanded vision of, of downtown and where the downtown should grow. So just looking at all these has really guided all of our, uh, our, our, our policy updates for the workplace element. And so this is translated into trends. And if you look at the policies and, and if you kind of follow the, the discussion, this seems to be the overall trends of, of federal workplace development. There's a consolidation of workspaces from leased to owned. Um, there's a sharing of space among employees. And this is a result of policies related to telework and flexible schedules where uh, employees need smaller spaces and, and can indeed share those. And this is translated into increased mobility among employees, which is tied, again, to the space requirements. So how it's really interesting to think about how these trends may play out in looking at the federal footprint in the national capital region. And I hope you guys can see that. One study that has been done by the, the District of Columbia Office of Planning uh, in coordination with GSA um, is a study that looks at where the federal footprint could shrink um, geographically should these trends continue. And this is just an illustration of one possible scenario, and we appreciate uh, the, the Office of Planning for letting us um, utilize this, this study. But it does, and, and it's, it's a pretty aggressive set of assumptions in this, but it does show a, a uh, relevant magnitude of where federal offices could go in the future should these trends continue. Um, and the green dots on the screen represent spaces, and you'll see them um, scattered throughout the region, and that's at, at a 2012 snapshot. And then you see the result, uh, 2027, where you see a smaller amount of dots and mostly concentrated in the core of the city. So if the current trends continue, you can see a decrease in overall federal footprint size in the national capital region, uh, a concentration of employees in federally owned spaces, which is a direct result of many uh, policies, and concentration of federal employees in the core of the city and near transit nodes in the region. Because again, that ties back to this notion of having federal facilities in direct proximity to transit. <clears throat> so in reorganizing the, uh, the element, we've concentrated the policies into three specific areas to try to address some of these issues. First is locating federal workplaces. That's the first area. And these are the policies related to siting of federal facilities. Um, the second area is developing and managing federal workplaces. Uh, there were numerous policies in the previous comp plan that get into how federal workplaces are, are managed and operated and um, dealing with things such as flexible uh, employee schedules and the like. Um, and we thought that those policies were really important to keep and we wanted to, to uh, create an area of the element that could, uh, that could encapsulate some of those, those themes. The third is the reuse of federal space and land. Um, there is certainly a push to um, dispose of or eliminate uh, any extra uh, federal property and spaces in agency portfolios, and we wanted to capture and provide some policies in that area. So in focusing on the first area, which is locating federal workplaces, the comprehensive plan has had um, throughout the uh, past couple of decades a policy called the central employment area, and this is defined in both the district and federal elements. And it's a geograph geographic boundary that represents the priority area for locating federal office spaces, both leased and owned. Um, this, this, and this image shows the current central employment area, which we're not recommending to be changed. Uh, this uh, current uh, boundary captures the hub of the regional transit network. Um, you have the hub of the uh, metro rail system. You have the regional commuter rails, Mark and VRE, having stations here, as well as the area where there's a tremendous amount of new investment in, in transit uh, systems, including things such as bike share. Um, the problem over the years is this is the management of the central employment area as a policy has become very informal. There's uh, discussions of off, oftentimes of adding specific parcels, um, whereas we think it should take a broader view and be used as a planning tool to support uh, the District of Columbia's development goals. Um, 
unfortunately, to, to create that process is kind of beyond the comprehensive plan, so we wanted to lay a foundation for doing that work in our policy update. Um, and I hate to put all this text up here, but such as such as policy. Um, the, the first update is, um, and we have the, the additional uh, policy language underlined. We're saying that the first priority for federal office spaces should remain the central employment area as, as the priority area for new federal office space, but the central employment area should reflect the District of Columbia's, Columbia's priority areas for commercial or mixed-use development and transportation investment that supports these policies that we've been talking about. And the District of Columbia, NCPC, and other federal agencies should evaluate the CEA every five years to ensure it reflects current priorities. So as development goals change, as the transit networks change, the CEA can be amended on a more formal basis to be used as a planning tool. Um, in the kind of priorities of uh, federal office space location, the second area would be those in proximity to transit. So the second policy would be beyond the CEA, give priority consideration to sites in proximity to transit and compatible with local planning efforts. Um, and in rare exceptions, agencies that have specific, specific operational or land use requirements associated with their missions could deviate from this requirement but, or, or policy. But we're seeing um, the CEA as the first priority and then proximity to transit as the second priority. Okay, so this is going to sound weird, but um, bear with me. And I want me not to pay attention to this. All right, so, um, so the second thing about giving priority consideration to sites in proximity to transit, absolutely. Compatible with local planning efforts, I want to, I want to raise that as an issue because the, the pattern has been in suburban locations is to find a really cheap piece of land. And often with not the zoning that you would want, it has zoning. Um, of some kind, uh, but it's almost certainly not a dense mixed-use zone that would give federal workers choices, uh, that would give them retail, that would give them a live-work opportunity, that it almost never has that kind of zoning. And so to say compatible with local planning efforts sounds like you have to live with what's there as opposed to using the, the opportunity of a federal lease or a federal procurement or whatever it might be to actually try to get uh, local governments to step up with better zoning that more reflects the uh, region forward plan, that more reflects uh, the kind of location that federal workers might most want to be in where they'll have not just transit choices but shopping choices, choices for places to eat. They can meet their daily needs near their workplace and they may even have the opportunity to live proximate. So it's kind of, yeah. Well, I don't want to interrupt the discussion, but uh, I mean, it seems to me it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing because the federal facility going there could spur those types of amenities, which I think you're referring to, kind of like the ATF example. Um, but I think there's. It's a language issue, though. Right. Right. I mean, it just takes a little more specific that it's not in a corridor square or something, but um, some notion of the of of the federal role in not just in accordance with, but. Um, uh, I don't know how to wordsmith. Well, I, so can, can we yes. work on? Uh -huh. We're not going to wordsmith it now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can we can we work on putting something together like this? Because I think of the tiger grants that DOT was putting out, and how um, how much work went into tr applying for those grants. Even though a tiny percentage of the applicants got the grants, the collaborations that happened actually caused good projects to go forward, even if they got not one dollar of federal funding. That's the kind of role that a big federal lease has. It could shape, uh, it could shape land uses much more desirably from the perspective of the future, make it much more likely, even if they don't get the lease, that because they've changed the land use that they would see better quality development in the future. Okay. And that's, I think, the opportunity that we want to try to capture. Okay. Well, I'll, and, I, and one thing I'll clarify when I get to the end of the presentation is there's certain opportunities to tweak language and make changes, particularly to this element because it's so big. We certainly expect to keep molding it before we bring the entire comprehensive plan back to, for a final adoption. But and we're kind of keeping a running list on all these. So, um, okay. Um, so beyond these location uh, priorities, there are other factors for consideration, and, 
And these policies come from certain executive orders and, and, and laws that have been passed, but also just good planning practice. Uh, other factors for consideration when making location decisions are the use of historic properties or properties within historic districts, uh, support of regional and local agency develop, development objectives, and, and maybe we can address some of that um, in those policies as well. Support the creation of employment opportunities in economically distressed areas, and this is a policy that has been in our comp plan for quite some time that we wanted to retain. And also to minimize develop, development of natural spaces uh, to help um, uh, uh, reach some sustainability and environmental goals. Can, can I st stop you here? Sure. Just for grins. Um, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the emphasis on historic properties, and not because I don't think they're a great idea. <clears throat> but um, uh, we have a large um, inventory of mid-century modern mm -hmm. that's not quite historic if you think about eligibility for the register as making a building historic. So I wonder if we might um, um, add something I, um, that that acknowledges these there's because there's such a huge inventory of these buildings they're not quite historic by definition but they they're it they have value they have value some of them some of them we'd like to see go away um, but but there's so much of that building stock that I think it's worth some notion of existing properties. I don't know because historic has a very specific meaning. That's mm. all. Yeah, and no, there's no, a the, lot the of emphasis in the language uh, uh, about it: historic districts, historic properties, or, or either that or 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 say what you mean, what we mean specifically. I know the genesis of the the, the uh, policy came from um, an executive order, the title which escapes me, which which directed federal agencies to. It to does. locate into historic properties. It or, does. Or, so, so maybe, so is there an additional qualifier beyond just historic that we should be adding in there? Um, we don't have to go with Smith. Yes, that that's okay. what I'd be looking for. Something additive, not not that 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 communicates that it doesn't ha necessarily have to be building stock that has achieved historic status. That's all. I mean. That's what, there's got to be one existing or two words that mean that. <laughs> okay. Or just existing inventory. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we can, we'll work on that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so another uh, policy within this area of the comp plan is this, what we call the 60-40 policy. And this has been in place quite some time. Um, this, uh, well, the policy itself says achieve within the District of Columbia a relative share of the region's federal employment that is not less than 60%. And basically what that means is that federal employment, 60% of the federal, uh, not less than 60% of the, of the federal workforce should be located in the District of Columbia. Um, this is a policy we're keeping in place. It's reflective of legislation, not only the, uh, the 1790 Residence Act, which established the District of Columbia as a seat of government, but also other laws, um, particularly one in 1947, which reiterated the fact that the District of Columbia is the symbolic and functional uh, city for the capital. Um, but what's interesting is um, over the years that proportion has decreased, um, although it's been level in the last um, a couple of decades. In 1960, the proportion of federal employment in the District of Columbia was 64 percent, um, and then since that time it has been hovering at around 50. So um, it's something. It's an interesting policy. We want to keep it in place because I think it represents symbolic and and legal <laughs> terms, but um, it's an important piece of data for the comp plan. It's something to think about in managing the federal workforce. Okay, so the second area is developing and managing federal workplaces. And again, these are policies that are to guide um, uh, federal agencies once federal workplaces, the, once the siting decision has been made and a federal installation or office is being constructed and managed. So the policies, and again, these are policy highlights. Um, there's a lot of policies, and I don't want to read from them word for word, but this is the general goals of these. The policies support a safe, sustainable, accessible, and flexible workplace. Uh, the policies promote live near your work and affordable housing efforts. Um, the federal government should be supportive of these types of, of efforts, particularly uh, in, in, in community development. And also reinforce the need for comprehensive master planning for large federal facilities. And the policies in this area uh, reiterate many of our submission guidelines uh, for large uh, installations uh, and their need for master planning. <clears throat> this area of the complaint also has some urban design related goals and a lot of these are um, uh, close to some of the policies we've developed in the urban design element, which, are, which again is out for draft. 
Um, the first, support development of amenities around federal facilities in cooperation with the surrounding community. And I think this might get to some of the stuff that Commissioner Trigoni brought up. Also, to reiterate important urban design goals such as active ground floors and the use of civic or commemorative art in activating public spaces. Um, and also, the policies recommend the exploration of public-private partnerships that can support community econo economic development, land use, and employment goals. And uh, we've seen some of these efforts already. I believe Suitland Federal Center uh, in that area is starting to work on such efforts, and so our comprehensive plan supports that. A, a new kind of theme for the comp plan uh, workplace element is the reuse of federal space and land. Um, and these policies support the productive reuse of underlies federal buildings and land. Um, and there's been much discussion about how federal agencies uh, can trim down their inventory or put to better use their space inventory. Um, the policies are reflective of legislation and directives such as the Public Buildings Cooperative Use Act of 1976, uh, things such as the Old Post, Post Office Redevelopment Act of 2008, and also the Presidential Memorandum Disposing of Unneeded Federal Real Estate. Um, and so this has become a bigger issue. There was actually an article in the paper two days ago about how GSA is developing ways for federal agencies to um, shed their extra inventory and evaluate that um, using real estate brokerages. So the policies um, uh, recommend utilizing available federally owned land or space before purchasing or leasing additional land or space to get the most um, out of existing inventories. Uh, they recommend developing strategies to minimize adverse economic impacts when um, an installation or a facility is leaving an area. Uh, dispose of excess federal property in a manner that ensures that its future use is coordinated with surrounding development plans. I think uh, a good example of this type of initiative would be the Southeast Federal Center, which um, was disposed of and is now uh, becoming the yards development right next to the Navy Yard, uh, private development, mixed use development. And also explore new federal and public uses before the property or facility is determined to be excess. So, and th these uses can include commemoration, art, or retail where possible. So basically, it's, it's putting to use this extra land um, for things that, that might be valuable before they're disposed of. Okay, so that's, that's an overview and, and, uh, and, and the highlights of the policy update. Uh, from here, the, um, the final process is that, well, first, the public comments have been addressed in the EDR, and again, we had a 60-day public comment period. You'll see some comments and how we responded to them and if they resulted in tweaking of the language, which some of them did. Um, the draft narrative has been added and will continue to be edited as the full comprehensive plan is compiled. Uh, minor revisions in policy language and the narrative can be accommodated prior to the full comprehensive plan being adopted. And again, this is a very, very, very broad element. We really want to keep working on this, um, but we want to kind of get the Commission's blessing that we're headed the right direction so that we can compile the entire comp plan and bring it back uh, at such time. So the Executive Director's recommendation is the Commission uh, approve final adoption of the updated policies to the federal workplace element. However, hold the policies in abeyance until all of the federal elements of the comprehensive plan uh, have been adopted. And this is the same uh, uh, commission action we've requested for the previous elements that we've brought back for final. So, Chairman, so move. A moment to comment after we. Right. It's been moved and seconded, and we'll have discussion. Ms. Wright? Mr. Chairman, I wanted to comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, that's all right. Uh, I moved it and asked to comment. First of all, I want to uh, uh, commend the staff for the work they've done on all this. Uh, I don't want to go back in history too much to 1978 when the Government Operations Committee had a responsibility for doing the first comprehensive plan, so which I chaired. So this stuff keeps coming at us. Uh, but uh, I know how what it was then, and this is just just a real, real major step. You know, we're a lot of work. Uh, I also support the comments made by some of my colleagues on trying to tweak that language to make it uh, work a little better for us. Uh, I have two questions too, and I don't think it, they need to be answered now, but. Given the, the, the potential shift of the FBI building from D.C., uh, I like to, I think it would be nice to get an idea what that might mean to us in terms of uh, where they may go. And also maybe the offset, if there is one, of the west campus of, the, of St. Elizabeth's, whether that even it's going to come to, to our community over in southeast, our, all of our communities. Uh, but uh, that may also be a factor. I'd be curious to see how that offsets, if at all, these numbers. Uh, the 50, was it the 40-60 split we used to have? 60, that was 60-40. Uh, and, and I've always argued or thought that the whether or not where the employees are may be less important than where they pay taxes. And where the government is may be less important than where contracting money is made and where contracting 
money makers live and work more than where the government may be seated. So um, anyhow, thank you very much, and I'll wait to see what happens. But Ms. Wright? Um, I have a, a couple of things. On, um, there, in the mobility business, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the assumption is that technology makes co-location and proximity no, no longer important. And I think something that acknowledges that seeming contradiction would be a good idea, because I hear that all the time. Um, uh, and it's obvious, right, that co-location still matters in sharing resources, et cetera, but people think that, you know, the, the commerce of human relationships can take place electronically now. And so what difference does it make? We can be anywhere. Um, so I think acknowledging that would be one thing. And the other thing that um, I... Um, I get what you're saying here. <clears throat> this is in section four of, this is again on location. Reserving the most prominent development sites for federal workplaces is troubling language to me. Okay. Just because, why? I'm, I mean, why not, you, you say development sites, it's again a wordsmithing thing, but I think it's of some importance that, um, you know, a, 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 even a big headquarters building is not necessarily the thing that you want on, for example, a in a historic landmark campus um, on a hill outside the Topo Bowl. You know what I mean? So maybe we don't want to say that. Okay. I, I know that is a that's a holdover from a previous comp plan, and we were debating on on how to tweak it. But I think that's that's some that's some good because uh, it could lead to that. I think it's just more of saving. It's more for a symbolic stance for some of the, the bigger agencies and where they might be in the federal core, but... Well, that's my point. Yeah. I mean, do we really want, would we want the FBI up on a hill overlooking Washington somewhere when that could be some other glorious symbolic thing okay. instead? Okay, we're working on it. Just saying. That's all. Uh, See, I'm, it, that, that's light duty, right? <laughs> uh, Mr. Prevention and then uh, Mr. Goni. I want to thank the staff on the uh, uh, report, very well researched, uh, a lot of uh, very helpful information. The organization into the three policy areas I thought was uh, was very helpful. One of the things I'm struggling with is trying to reconcile, uh, there's some charts on page 19 and 20, uh, the what-if scenario that the Office of Planning had done. And I couldn't tell whether it was using a real-world GSA strategy or historical, or excuse me, a, uh, a strategic plan or exactly what this was. But Graphically, it appears that while well, the uh, federal presence in the district as well as in the uh, uh, central employment area is maintained, the, the, the presence of the federal government outside D.C. collapses, continues to draw down. Is that, is that the takeaway? Is that the message? Well, I, I think well, – I don't – um, no, I, I think, well, for the, the, the dots represent spaces, and it's basically showing first a shrinking of the footprint. You see lesser dots. Right. Um, but then if you apply these assumptions, which were used in the study, this is the outcome. So you're talking about locating close to transit, uh, locating in owned spaces, which are predominantly in the core. This is where the, the reduced number of dots would land. Okay. If that makes sense. In the central employment area, do we have a, a, a sense of the percentage of space utilization at this time? Is, for example, is it at 50 percent, so we have a lot of capacity in the... For federally owned buildings? Yes. I, I don't know that number. We can find out. I'm just trying to see if we, if we have a self... If we have a limiting factor here in that there's... The bulk of the space is already used, so we don't have a lot of growth, short of tearing down existing buildings and building larger, taller ones. I mean, I think the biggest the factor is honestly the square footage of space per person, and that's a moving target. So I think coming that down. coming down coming in many down. agencies, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay. Uh, what I think DC is a is an incredibly unique environment for a variety of reasons. When you look at trying to balance transportation, housing, employment, affordability, energy, environmental compliance, sustainability, land use planning, green space management, historic preservation, and on and on and on, it's it's an incredibly complex. Um, the, there was a Census Bureau study recently that says something like 540,000 people commun 
commute every day into and out of the district. That's the numbers that I have. I don't know if they're uh, exa exactly up to date. But there's a very, very dynamic environment. Some people have referred to it as a friends with benefit relationship that the district has with the outlying environments in that they come here for the employment and then they take their money and they go home in the evening. Yeah, what's the and benefit? I'm, I'm, to, to which party? Yes. To, to the district or uh, to, to, the district. To, to the suburb? I'm not, see, I'm not seeing it. So it's uh, depending on which way you, you flip, flip the relationship. But it's very interesting. I think I, I, I'm absolutely supportive of the policies of, this, of the maintaining of the 60 percent. Looks like we have a little bit of a deficit. Um, is there, for example, uh, is the is this a good place to put in a goal for something along the lines of what? Per, well, we want 60 percent of the agencies to work in the district. Uh, do we have a target as to, for example, what percentage of the federal workforce we would like to be residents of the district in order to build and sustain that relationship and sense of community and how do we engagement? Get how, how, how do we go about that? And, and, what's, and what's the right number? Yeah, yeah. We don't have such a policy. But That's, that would be challenging. DC, a lot of the areas where D.C. is special, we spend more money in D.C. Uh, than any other state, and I think the ratio is something like four times what the state of Virginia spends. Our teachers are among the highest paid, but we don't have the, the performance uh, and uh, standardized test scores. D.C. per a 19, uh, or excuse me, a 2013 study by the Council of Community and Economic Research said that D.C. was America's eighth least affordable city. So we've got these positives and they've got these er areas of challenge. Another one is bike share. Look at the explosion of that wonderful program. Look at parks. Don't we have, aren't we in the top three or four Six. cities Six. in the nation for the numbers Six. of parks and as well as accessibility to parks? So there's many, many positives that D.C. has, but also some, uh, some special challenges. And there's one just uh, area that we had concern about. In the, in the element, I think it's B, it talks about... Yeah, uh, be on developing and managing federal workspaces. In 25, it says something like leasing or sharing space to include residential for federal facilities. Is this, for example, um, as opposed to having a commercial venture on the street level of a federal facility, we might have residential there or vice versa? Federal um, government residential on the ground floor and, and or res, excuse me, federal government on the ground floor and residential above. It's just more is about the, I, I think it's more getting towards the goal of, of um, uh, proximity to, or federal employees having uh, housing in proximity to their workplace. Exactly. Um, and it's also an idea that, that has been put out about more possible federal facilities or federal office spaces being incorporated with residential. I agree. That was, that's the intent, but it talks about the, the language is lease or share space at federal workplaces and that identifies re residential. Right. Yeah. Leading one to believe that co-locating <coughs> residential with the federal agency. And I just could, I, we, we like to have aspirational goals, but I'm just trying okay. to wrap my head around that, that particular concept. And perspirational goals. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goning. Thank you. Um, so two things. Um, if you think about some recent federal location decisions, the things that gave this commission the most heartburn had to do with the, the impacts on the transportation network in the region. And I don't see it much in here about federal lo uh, workplace location decisions with respect to transportation. So I'm wondering, um, for example, we could even talk about the FBI, that, that there are places you could put the FBI that would actually benefit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the transit network and, uh, you know, and fill seats in directions that are currently empty, or you could put the FBI in a location where it would have exactly the opposite effect, where we're already deeply burdened in terms of capacity and that would make it worse. Remember all the talk about, uh, uh, you know, the Mark Center and the traffic and all of that? That was because we moved people from a transit-oriented location to a place that wasn't served by transit. And so I just feel like that's a huge question in our region, and that should be something specifically called out okay. in terms of workplace decisions. That's one thing. Okay. It, it is, but the, but the, but. I noticed that, I mean, transit-oriented is not a phrase that's used. And um, it does say there are several bullet points that spell it out, because I, I was know, looking it, for it too, but it doesn't specifically say, uh, use that phrase, well, it doesn't which maybe look, it should. It doesn't look to make strategic location <clears throat> decisions that use the capacity 
in the region more effectively? Because you could put it at two different transit sites. One would be hell, and one would be fantastic in terms of the capacity and the uh, off, you know, the 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 uh, off peak uses. So. East of the region in general, it doesn't have as much employment. Everyone moves from east to west at the beginning of the workday and back west to east at the end of the workday. And that's, you know, we, we don't have balance in our system, and that's why. So something along those lines. And the other thing has to do with, you know, how does this even get implemented? Like some of the stuff I was reading was kind of news to me in this workplace element. So like I'm not, we're not getting a report when we see the, the uh, information coming to us saying this is how it contributes or detracts from a comp plan mm -hmm. goal uh, that's established in the federal elements. And I don't know if that means revising the, the sheet to, and, and doing some analysis as part of, the, as part of your, your own very already wonderfully comprehensive workup of a given project. Mm -hmm. Um, I will just say, not to toot our own horn, but we do. We did just release a really beautiful uh, comp plan progress report for the district. So every two years, we do a progress report. Um, you know, we don't have such a sheet and an analysis for the zoning commission or other things, but we do use uh, frequent opportunities to reward and highlight people who are doing wonderful things to implement the comp plan and by you know, reverse implication, shame people who aren't doing things that they should be doing. And sometimes that includes a, a chart showing, you know, where uh, short-term and medium-term actions have or haven't been done and who's responsible to do them. So I'm just thinking there's not a lot of accountability for this. These are great goals, but as you can see by the 60-40 by the, uh, rule, you know, that even though we've been moving away f uh, from it for five decades, uh, that 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 has that hasn't affected any decision whatsoever. It's a it's a federal law, and it's it's actually our federal our members of Congress who are most active um, trying to get us to make that statistic even worse than it is right now. So I'm just saying we we need to think about ways, uh, if not to uh, be strictly accountable, you know, uh, to at least highlight uh, whether or not these policies or these or specific actions that the commission gets to review are pulling toward or away from these uh, these comp plan goals. And, and the progress report was passed around the office. We've been looking at it. So. Isn't it nice? Yeah. We may plagiarize. There was a reference made to uh, Mark Center and the traffic management uh, that was predicted there, which has not come to fruition, let the, re let the record state, due to the advanced pre-identification of those issues and tens of million dollars in investment and supplemental transportation and partnering between Federal Highway Administration, VDOT, City of Alexandria, and all of the partners in that area. So there's a there's an example of a, I would say, crisis of, of averted and avoided. Yeah, and the Mark Center issue did um, pro, uh, cause us to do a policy in our transportation element, which the commission's approved, that talks about federal agencies helping to alleviate capacity problems off-site. So some of those issues, uh, that, that, that project brought up some good issues for our transportation element. Mr. Anything else? Yes. I just wanted to say you know, that we're blessed at this point to have a lot of uh, statistical av data available to us to do some analysis that we may not have had historically. And I think that one thing that, that, that's been pointed out by comments that have made that there's some quantitative things that may help see some of these conceptual ideas sort of evaluated better to see whether they're doing things or not doing things. Uh, I didn't want to really hear the statistics about the schools and all that kind of stuff, but there are other way, other things. But there are things that we can measure, mm -hmm. and I think it'd be good if we sort of think about how we can maybe in the future connect some analysis and some measurements here to guide us, rather than just ideas which sound good and <coughs> may be good but may not. If you look at the numbers, yeah. no, we agree too. Ms. White. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo that, and I, I love the idea of a progress report, and are these things being impacted? The study that you mentioned that talks about Washington, D.C. being the sixth best park district is um, according to a measure that our organization does, <laughs> and it's fascinating that we we are doing this on an annual basis in the the um, the competition, the friendly competition it sets up with different cities, like, well, who's got the better one and how did we advance from one year to the next? It really makes a difference when you measure these things. So I really welcome that idea to see if there's a way, if we're to see if we're making an impact too. Uh, just clarification, while we are perhaps about to 
do final adoption but still hold it in abeyance. We're keeping a running list of tweaks that can be made. Absolutely. Even though we're doing yeah, so, yeah. so called final adoption. We don't adoption. overwhelm the commission all at once with yep. the comp plan with the fresh stuff in it. We wanted to. But when the some... whole document comes back before us, mm -hmm. there will be an opportunity to do some tweaking. Yeah, yeah. And we're keeping a list of issues like for the environment element, there was an issue. Uh, um, some policy recommendations that happened in, during the discussion that we're keeping a list of. So, yeah, and we'll bring those to your attention when we come back for final. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All uh, Is there a motion on the EDR? Well, there has been a motion and a second. All in favor of the EDR, uh, before you say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Thank you, Mr. Zayden, very much. Okay, so I will get in trouble if I don't put this up. So, um, we are having a... <laughs> But wait, there's one of you saw the panic when the screen went dark. Um, the, the foreign missions element, it, we are having a meeting for the foreign missions element next week, uh, June 11th, uh, here at NCPC's offices from 6 30 to 8 30. Uh, Angela Marr will be presenting from our staff, and also we have Cheryl Corley uh, from Cultural Tourism coming to discuss how they've been working international organizations and foreign missions into the cultural life of the city. So it should be really interesting, and, and I hope everybody can join us. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The last item on our agenda is an information item. That's agenda item number 6A. It's the Southwest Echo District and the 10th Street Streetscape and Bannerker Park Connection concepts. We have Ms. Sullivan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. It's my pleasure to be here today to give an information presentation on the 10th Street Streetscape and Bannerker Connections concepts. Uh, I'm joined here today by Otto Condon with CGF uh, Architects, who's our consultant on this project, and uh, I'll just give you a brief overview, and then he's going to walk you through some of the details. Uh, as I'm sure you recall, you, this commission accepted the Southwest Eco District Plan uh, this past January, and uh, a critical recommendation in this plan is the connection from the National Mall to the waterfront, and uh, that is via 10th Street as a green and vibrant civ civic corridor, and then through through Banneker Park. And so that's not only very integral to the Southwest Eco District vision, but it's also um, this project is timely uh, in light of other activity that's happening uh, in the Southwest Eco District area today. Uh, as you know, GSA is um, anticipating the release of an RFP for the area in blue or a portion of that area uh, early this fall. And we would like for this project, the 10th Street work, to inform uh, that RFP, especially the right of way for 10th Street, as you see, goes right through uh, the middle of, their, of the um, Federal Triangle South area. And then we're also coordinating this project with work underway at the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian Institution uh, has begun their master planning process for uh, their buildings along the National Mall, and this will include uh, the Smithsonian Castle and the Haupt Garden, which is the gateway to 10th Street. So we're very excited about that, and I should probably have more to report on in the fall with regard to that. And then we are also coordinating with the National Park Service uh, with their cultural landscape report which really uh, will function as sort of a precursor to the determination of eligibility that will need to be done for the Banneker site. We will not be able to take our concept any further um, than just concept um, until this determination of eligibility for the historic register is done for that site. And then finally, with regard to private development, uh, JBG is moving forward on their proposed concept for the office building at the L'Enfant Complex. You can see uh, in the image on the lower right here, uh, it's actually uh, pretty far along, and we've had um, some really good conversations with them with regard to their public realm and how that's going to interface with our uh, proposed concepts for 10th Street. So as you know, this is uh, not the first time that we uh, that planning for 10th Street uh, has been underway. In fact, it's um, there's there've been many planning efforts for the past couple of decades, starting with Art and Cotton Moore's uh, small area, um, Arthur Cotton Moore's uh, uh, Maryland Avenue study. The district did a, a, an environmental assessment for L'Enfant Plaza and the Banneker Park improvements. Uh, as part of this, the Washington Interdependence Council was very involved in this and c continues to this day to advocate for a memorial to Benjamin Banneker. Uh, and then NCPC's uh, work uh, also with regard to like, the legacy plan, the monumental core framework plan, and then of course culminating here with the Southwest Eco District plan. And so I, I just want to acknowledge all of that previous work. Our project partners for this particular project are the National Park Service and the District Department of Transportation. And then we've also pulled together um, our key stakeholders working group uh, with all of the folks you see here. Um, and we're very grateful to their participation in that. 
And then we've also been um, interacting with some of the private property owners as well, in particular PN Hoffman and, and JBG, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We started our, um, we kicked off this project in December, and we've had three very successful workshops uh, over at ZGF, um, looking at the vision for this street, the constraints that you'll hear about today, which inform, are informing our design, uh, and some of the alternatives that we're looking at, and then we've had a couple of informational exchanges with the property owners as well. The Southwest Eco District Task Force saw this work on May 1st, and so I will, um, following Otto's presentation, just summarize some of the, the thoughts that we heard from the task force. And then we also just had a public meeting, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know what uh, the public had to say about this as well. And so where we're headed, uh, we will be briefing CFA on June 20th, and then uh, we will be um, probably uh, bringing the task force back together in late summer and uh, hope to have concept conceptual designs to both NCPC and CFA this fall. And so uh, I'm just going to walk through the project purpose to tee up uh, Otto's discussion. Specifically for 10th Street, as I mentioned, we're looking at that cross-section and um, the right-of-way um, for the right-of-way dimensions for 10th Street to help inform uh, GSA's RFP and we're preparing conceptual designs as you'll see and identifying programmatic opportunities for phased improvements on 10th Street and I want to be clear that DDOT does not have the mon money for this project right now we will bring this to concept in the fall and then after that take a break from the the planning work and the design work and actually work with DDOT and the Southwest Eco District Task Force um, on creative ways to fund this project and then with regard to the Banneker pedestrian connection, um, we're designing the connection to link the overlook down to the wharf. This is funded, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, PN Hoffman is, um, needs to fund this as part of their approval for the PUD for their wharf development. So that's why we've been working closely with them on this as well. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask Otto to come up and walk through a presentation. And then I will be back up to just uh, go through some of the comments that we've heard. Thank you, Diane. Good afternoon. Um, the image right now, as you see, maybe you recall from the plan, uh, it was our concept for 10th Street. It's built as a structure, and we thought underneath 10th we could use uh, as an area for cisterns to collect stormwater in order to um, reuse the stormwater as part of the development. Um, so, and uh, to remind you, the water targets for the plan were to try to retain 95% of uh, rain, the rain events, and which is about 1.7 inches and also reduce potable water use by 70%, which is part of the executive order. Following the acceptance of the plan, we've been doing a more detailed stormwater plan, and what, what, we're, what we're finding right now that um, in order to get to the 70% 70 70 reduction in potable water, uh, we can definitely uh, collect and reuse all the stormwater um, that falls on the site, uh, both for um, some building uses, also for irrigation. Um, there will be, and some of that water can be used for um, directly if it's off of roofs for things such as flushing building, uh, flush, toilet flushing, um, without, without any treatment really. Um, but in order to, to uh, use, to, to hit the potable water use reduction, um, we'll, we'll have to get innovative in terms of how to do some treatment of the additional storm water uh, potential to collect condensate um, from all the building cooling and also potential additional sources of water um, in order to, to reduce the goal um, to, so that we're really only drawing 30 percent of the uh, put of water use from uh, the DC water system. Um, and so th that's basically our conclusions. We're still fleshing out the, the final re um, the white paper um, and also working closely with DDOE in terms of how the potential for um, Right now, with the revised stormwater uh, regulations, there's opportunities for credits and using some innovative uh, strategies, we may be able to use some of these uh, DDOE credits and subscriber fees to help finance some of these improvements. And so that's how we're starting to continue to uh, our study. Uh, so to talk about 10th Street and the Banneker connection, uh, we've, we're not here with concepts. We're really still trying to frame the conversation and get input so that we can take all this input to um, further develop a concept for the fall, as, as Diane mentioned. Um, and you may remember these uh, diagrams which show uh, the, the real, the idea of a green connection connecting the mall to the waterfront, um, and also a very active 10th Street that is, um, as shown in the uh, illustration of the right, programmed for festivals, 
and also a real curbless environment, so it's very permeable for pedestrians. So we always call this a street. It's not really a street. It's essentially three bridges, uh, Maryland Avenue, the LaFont area, and the freeway connected by, by soil. Um, and this has really helped to guide how we're actually looking at what is the, what is the character of the street uh, of, ten, of Tenth as it connects the mall down to the waterfront. Also, as Diane mentioned, there isn't funding for a major, you know, singular project to revitalize 10th Street. And as part of the, our study is to look at how this may be phased. And there's actually logical um, phasing for the improvements. The Federal Triangle South is one project that it could occur at one time. Maryland Avenue, um, the capping of Maryland. Uh, DDOT is currently undertaking a study for uh, how that, the, the next step of the small area plan and how that can actually be capped. Uh, the LaFont Plaza with some of the private development, some of the improvements may be done contingent with uh, what JBG is doing. The freeway, which has always been identified as a long-term plan, uh, as part of capping, that would be when the improvements could be married um, to that process. And then Banneker uh, as the final program um, for potential cultural institutions that could, they could occur uh, uh, with Banneker. <coughs> so even though we talk about a unified connection, there also seems that it could be episodic, so it's not necessarily you know, a singular experience. It should read as, it should feel as one experience, but there's opportunities for um, really experiencing it as you move down the street. We think there's a great way to, um, at the, uh, across the Smithsonian, we're, really, we're calling it the magnet, because that's really where you first want to attract people, because now nobody goes there, so you're going to have to have a real good attraction at that point to pull people into 10th. Uh, the intersection of Maryland and 10th is um, an opportunity for some cultural facilities. The street itself, or bridge, actually um, increases in elevation from 38 feet up to 52 feet, right across from LaFont Plaza. And that's really the peak of the, the bridge. And we think that's actually something to take advantage of, the existing street. Um, and then it tapers down to Banneker, and where we think with whatever happens at the Banneker Overlook, that's an opportunity for really creating the, the sense of a prospect looking over the river. Excuse me. To start to, it may be a few years before something happens on 10th Street. And there's a real, we think there's a real opportunity to create some excitement in the short term. And there's a lot, there was a lot of talk about is there an opportunity for moving programming off of the mall? Um, we also thought, you know, there's a lot of things happening on Penn. Would some of those events actually fit onto 10th Street? So the illustration on the left actually shows an event. Um, right across from the FBI, and we've just superimposed it onto uh, the DOE site, and it basically goes from Independence to Maryland. Maybe that's a, with the district, um, with the potential of a bid being established, it's an opportunity to set the stage in the short term to start to get people to, under, to get a new perspective of what 10th Street is. There's a lot of examples of that the RCMA's commission and the district have done in terms of temporary urbanism, use the festivals to start to reprogram and change the perception of the street uh, with art, with furnishings, uh, with parklets, and really start um, to inform what the ultimate design might be by actually using as a pilot and a test for how the spaces could be uh, managed. We did actually look at what could fit on the street. Uh, the diagram on the right is all the program uses for the solar decathlon. Um, it does show that you really couldn't do the solar decathlon on 10th Street um, because by the time you put everything there, there's no room for anybody else. Um, the diagram to the south is actually the Festival of India. And as we looked at the cross section of 10th, we think there's an opportunity for <coughs> creating a flexible programming space, um, how the media might be treated, and in looking at circulation that the way that the cross section is, is designed, it can maintain vehicular circulation, but also create areas for, uh, for programming. We have been, we will be, and have been using the 2005 EA as the base case in order to build upon that so that um, looking at it from a structural point of view from uh, the costing so that it's a continuation or an, an enhancement and build upon that study. Um, and actually right now the, as the EA actually identified rehabilitation of the, the bridges and that's occurring um, t uh, currently um, on, along 10th Street and the bridges. So in terms of the section, um, if you recall, there's about, at the DOE site, there's about 225 feet from building face to building face. 
The actual right of way is 150 feet. In the Southwest Eco District plan, we looked at at least 140 feet for the right of way. Um, as we started to look further into the cross section and programming opportunities, we thought that um, the 150 feet should stay 150 feet. There's no need to um, to revise the existing right of way. But how that actual um, street the street is configured is it can be reconfigured to better accommodate um, events. Like right now, the median is 39 feet, and the roadways are 26 and a half feet. We think we could put the roadways on an asphalt diet and um, take about five feet out of each of the roadways, which will still accommodate uh, travel lane and parking, and add 10 feet to the median to further um, make it uh, possible for better programming along the median. Uh, with the sidewalks, which are 29 feet, we think that actually we could re we redefine those to include a cycle track um, on the, along the curb edge, which still allows a 24-foot sidewalk, plenty of room for trees, furnishing, and through zones. And when development comes up to the edge, uh, active building frontage zones for cafes and such. Um, in looking at the design, we actually started to uh, build a 3D model of it just to understand the, the complexity of a bridge, which essentially has three different orientations of the structure and how we might surgically insert trees. And we wanted to make sure that if we were trying to put trees on a bridge, that it was realistic. Um, and what, was, what we could do in terms of the actual tree types and, and what the resulting canopy might be. And th this, these three sections illustrate uh, the three strategies which we, we believe are, are possible. Um, the, one, the lowest one is if the bridge structure has about five foot clear between the beams, we could surgically insert um, tree wells, get enough soil for small trees, maybe 15 to 20 feet high. If you start, and that would assume that you have basically a, a very horizontal surface for the whole street. If we start to raise the, the planter wells, um, maybe they're 18 inches, so there's still a little bit of mounding, it will allow a larger tree growth. And then as we looked at the, the, um, the structure itself, there's a point where if you try to cut too much into the bridge, it's no longer a bridge and it's pretty much structurally going to fail. And uh, working with the uh, consultants who actually did the EA, uh, the, we, we came up with the idea that if we're going to create a cistern in the median, maybe we actually take the one bridge, chop it into two bridges, and actually create enough area for both the cistern and enough dirt to really grow trees of a, of a larger canopy, which is the top section. Um, in terms of how we're looking at stormwater treatment, um, and as part of the stormwater plan, there's an opportunity for both using it in the buildings, but also using it to enhance the, envir the physical environment and the, the design of the space. Um, and so we are looking at what, how the trees might be integrated with the stormwater and what that actually means in terms of the types and the size. So go, go back to that. Yeah. So It just has to do with the, the variety of species. I mean, it looks like you have a more continuous canopy when it's not integrated, and you have a you have less of a canopy when it is integrated. But that's just a function of the trees you happen to pick for this illustration. Well, generally, with if you the trees that are integrated with stormwater, their their the roots will be in, in water more often, and so the growth of the trees tends to be a little smaller. So if we don't integrate the stormwater planters with the trees, um, <coughs> these are illustrating different types that. Um, you may get a, a broader canopy, a different type of canopy, if you're not integrating the trees with the stormwater. But are you showing different varieties of trees or a different growth pattern with the same tree? This actually has different trees. Because you wouldn't do, there are some trees that are more cell tolerant that, um, and with runoff on the streets that you would use in an integrated stormwater plan versus some that aren't, aren't tolerant that can grow. Okay. I mean, my only point is that, is that, I think we're going to be increasingly interested, especially on this very broad street with shade. So the more tree canopy in some ways, the better. So I'd love to find trees that have both the ability to tolerate salt and to be wet more, more often, but that also give us a more continuous canopy for what it's worth. Is it there we go. Sorry. I haven't, still haven't mastered this button. The, um, um, but aren't you going to be capturing the stormwater anyway? I mean, isn't the, you know, the strategies where you integrate the stormwater within the tree planting usually has to do with being able to um, have that stormwater 
um, filter into the existing soil, right? So, but you you aren't you going to be capturing all that stormwater anyway? So is there really a great advantage to integrating the stormwater with the tree planting? Well, and that's part of our modeling too. Is how much do we capture? How much if you run it through? A storm planter, you're going to lose some to the tree right. and to the soil, or do we basically try to collect it all um, and essentially mechanically collect it, which, which and redistribute it where you need it, yeah. right? Yeah, and so that's really the when we get into the the, the alternatives um, and the modeling we're doing, you know, where where do we want to like how do we want to collect the stormwater, how do we want to use it? So we've um, have three alternatives. One is what we call it an emphasis on hardscape, which is really taking the existing environment and inserting trees. It's probably the most, um, we can make it a curbless environment. Um, it's also the, probably the most flex flexible for programming. Uh, then there is, uh, the second one is an emphasis on softscape, which is, you know, really to kind of get your opinions on and everyone's advice on what does the continuation of the mall mean? Does it, should it have some green horizontal surfaces for more passive activity? Um, in this case, if it's a little more green, that's where we may integrate stormwater treatment along uh, the, the median and the curbs. Um, they can be separate stormwater treatment. They can also be integrated with the trees. Um, doing this, that will guide how much the street may be programmed for activities. And then finally, as we're looking at the stormwater plan, um, how can we use water to further uh, reinforce the eco-district experience and um, with the water, we can do some surface treatment where, in some cases, it may be potable, but as it's moving through the street, it becomes treated through landscape, and it's not relying on purely mechanical treatment um, below the street. So we have three um, or four diagrams for each of these concepts. The first is, the top one is the tree canopy. Um, and in all these, in all concepts, we're trying to basically, um, as much as possible, have a, have a tree canopy which extends from Independence to, uh, to, to Banneker Overlook. Um, in terms of the ground plane, this diagram, which is the hardscape, is really the trees um, are inserted in the, in the structure and it's probably most hardscaped um, in the median and also the curbs so that it's as, as uh, the feeling of a plaza um, extending from Independence to Banneker. And in terms of programming, this is the most um, flexible for programming because with the extent of hardscape, you can you could ultimately program along the whole street. Uh, we do think that there are areas that um, should be designed to accommodate uh, additional or larger events, such as in the Magnet area next to Independence, which may be from Independence to Virginia. Uh, at the high peak across from LaFont Plaza, um, that seems to be a good area for the urban plaza, and then also the, the prospect next to Banneker. Uh, these diagrams illustrate uh, and this is the, let's say, the smaller tree um, insertion. Uh, but you can see on the left diagram where the, with the extent of hardscape, you could start to program in the median pretty much everywhere because the tree, it's really just trees, tree wells, and, uh, and, the, um, and paving. The, uh, in the case of the small trees, I mean, if, it, if we want to try to get a continuous canopy, I think the smaller the tree, we may end up planting more um, like a muse of trees or an LA of trees is that you know you may do multiple row of four versus having a uh, row of two. And then these are some images which start to illustrate more what that the experience might be um, with the the trees, the horizontal uh, hardscape um, uh, uh, in terms of materials and just more open along the ground plane. The second one, the framework uh, for the softscape framework is again looking at uh, the a continuous tree canopy, and I should I should um, sort of preface this with as we've been presenting these to the task force and also to the public meeting, you know these aren't three distinct ideas, and so some of these uh, purposely illustrate uh, um, different ideas. So like on the tree canopy for uh, the softscape at the plaza, maybe there's really a break of the the tree canopy, but it could be an architectural treatment um, or it's a more open plaza. That might be an, uh, an idea to create some area where it's more open to the sky. Um, here, it also shows that the between, like the magnet, and between the urban plaza, um, it's really more of a lawn, horizontal lawn, and that could be either literally a lawn or it could be some mounding um, in order to help the tree growth. Uh, but it's really intended for a little bit more passive connection, a little bit more sense of how you might experience them all. Uh, 
as we start to look at more lawns or softscape in the medium, that does, the, the third diagram circulation suggests that the whole street's not going to be permeable and that pedestrians can cross anywhere, that there'll be some locations where the plaza, where it may be a real curbless environment, but in other locations, because of the landscape, you'd really probably limit your, your crossing at intersections and maybe some mid-blocks. Finally, the programming suggests, too, that there's with the section, you may end up closing one of the streets for festivals, um, still accommodating two-way travel uh, on one of the travel lanes. And one of the, I didn't say this, even though we put the, the, the existing roadways, we could put them on a road diet. Um, right now, they're about 20, well, 26 and a half feet. If we reduce them to 20 feet, when they're operating as a one-way street in each direction, that, that provides a travel lane and then also on-street parking. So if there's a festival where you close one street, you would still have 20 feet, you could have two-way travel um, during festivals. And that also would accommodate emergency access. Um, and so it still keeps the street somewhat active. Again, this just starts to show, uh, in partial plan on the left is, if it's a more lawn environment with a walkway, um, you start to use the street for some of the activities of the, the programming. And here with, uh, depending on how the median is treated or if we start to do some mounding for the trees, we can start to get a, a, a greater growth on the, along the median. And just uh, some examples of what that might, uh, might be, both um, in a more horizontal uh, softscape or even start to create some sculptural mounting um, along the median. Finally, the displaying water framework is really the idea of not just collecting all the water and storing it below the street, but start to using it, use it to display um, along the, 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 the entire street. And again, the idea would be maybe in the active areas, if there's a fountain, that's where it'd be potable water, and then you can mix that with the stormwater, and as it's going through the landscape, you can start to treat it with the plantings and uh, start to clean it that way as it, then you collect it, and then you can still reuse it in the building. But as noted, the, the more you treat it through landscape, the less you'll, um, or the more you'll end up losing to evapotranspiration. So that uh, creates, starts to having to find a balance for how to use that water in terms of for the landscape or for uh, the buildings themselves. Again, this is pretty similar to the softscape. It would, um, along the street for the ground plane and circulation, depending on how it's designed, it's going to uh, have less permeability across the, court, the length of the street. But then also, and for programming, the idea is that you program along one of the street and then have select programming areas for um, along the median. And here, we've also just illustrated, we think along Maryland, there's probably an opportunity for some programming activity so that as Maryland becomes active, 10th can start to capture some of that energy and, re and reinforce and support it. Um, here's uh, a plan. Again, it's rather similar in terms of programming um, to the softscape. And some ideas on um, the, the range of water treatment that could occur. You know, it could be very passive, uh, Millennium Park. Um, it could be the lower left one is uh, the new housing at Washington um, Circle done by GW, um, built actually above a parking garage. So it's a similar technology that might be required. There's opportunities for um, a little more interactive in terms of uh, like fog fountains for play if that's one area. Um, so we think there's a lot of opportunities if we get a sense that there's an emphasis to really do, um, start to celebrate the water um, as an element. And I will say, we, you know, we've heard, you know, originally 10th Street had water, it failed. Um, and that's why we think it's got to be more than just an aesthetic and it has to have a role and a function and it's going to be part of the management of the street. As I mentioned, there's an opportunity for even the urban plaza area in terms of how that's programmed. Maybe it's more um, an opening in the bosque of trees. Perhaps it's an architectural feature, a canopy, and that canopy might also reinforce the energy story with uh, photovoltaics, um, reinforce the rhythm of the street, um, or perhaps it's an interactive water feature such as uh, Millennium Park. Um, it was actually also built on a, on a rail yard and a parking structure, um, but really creates a sense of it's the attractor for um, an identity for the, the Grant Park in that area. You want to stop or just go through? Okay. So I'll just uh, quickly go through the Banneker um, connection. And this is 
essentially what we're looking before at. Before you go, uh, is there any, any discussion on the, before we go to Bannock Park, is there any discussion of what you heard on 10th Street proper? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, first, there, there is no intent to have non, uh, other, no vehicular movement over the Banneker into M Main Avenue. That's strictly going to be bikes, walking, et cetera. Is that correct? Um, well, you no know, cars are going to go down there. There's not going to be that type of well, current, I mean, currently cars go down 10th and can go around the circle. No, I'm talking about when you drive down 10th, you can't fly over top and land, oh, no. and you're not going to try to create a way for that to happen, no. correct? Okay. I'm really, I think it's a great place for programming. And I'm just wondering, uh, everything around it, uh, 10th Street from Independence down to uh, Maine, uh, has access, I believe, from below. You can get into the hotel from below. You can get into most of the buildings, I think, except for the government buildings. From So you could almost close off that. If you wanted to program it and make it isolated for some event, you could almost close off that and not create any access problems other than the you know, emergency. Is that, well, is that wrong? Street. You can you can access um, yeah vehicular from from uh, essentially D Street down to Main or the, the yeah. frontage road. So so that street. Let me ask the question again specifically. That area from Independence to Banneker Park, that street can be closed off without necessarily hampering access to some of the other buildings in that area. Is that correct? Yeah, for for events. Well, a period of time. Yeah. I'm just because it makes it a great programming area if you could have that set aside. Yeah. And, uh, and and you have the image here, which I have not seen, but have been advised by my colleague here that the New York scene with the, the pictures on the wall that goes up Chicago. there, Chicago is Chicago. There's a lot of opportunities uh, on walls <coughs> around it to be able to have large screens, and and it could really be a great programming area, even with some trees. And is that is that possible? Well, I think for it to be successful, programming is going to be critical. Yeah. Well, that's what and I'm that's, talking about, programming. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. that's what makes it come alive. Yeah. Particularly with reaching down to Maine again. So I think, well, I think it's great. I just wanted to understand that you could cut it off and really make it a, a venue that has some control access for people to come and see some kind of a major event, a presentation of some kind. Yeah, I think, I agree. I think it can be, in, can be designed so that it can function if you closed off the street yep. that for, for a major event. And I think that, that's part of creating the energy yep. to connect the mall. And really, I mean, that's an extension of the mall is if it feels and Then people can like, walk to it, yeah. but there wouldn't be cars coming through. And you could have large screens at each end and on each side, and people could observe something happening and maybe have live. Um, thank you very much. I don't want to try program now, but I like what you think. Thanks. So I'll go over the banneker quickly. Um, this is just the aerial showing. Um, the, the idea of an interim connection. Um, and again, with the model uh, that's out in the lobby and from the Eco District Plan, the, the, the idea of creating an interim connection. Um, and you know, through the process, there was a lot of coordination with the Waterfront Plan um, and the uh, Southwest Eco District Plan in order to think how that connection might occur. Um, and so, as part of the study for this interim connection, we want to look at what the phasing might be, um, you know, what the experience, is, can it be a universal experience in terms of both uh, disabled access and also um, able to access, and then what the wayfinding is necessary to really give people a sense of from 10th to the waterfront. As Diane mentioned, um, in these blue circles on the upper left, uh, as part of the PUD for the waterfront, uh, the a temporary stair from Banneker was um, identified and committed to from PN Hoffman uh, to fund in order to create the connection down to the, to the waterfront. And this is actually how the showing um, the illustration in the PUD how that access ends at a 100 foot corridor to the water with a little festival marketplace. Um, and you see in the foreground that's the lower service road. So this photo is taken pretty much leading over the top wall of the Banneker um, water fountain area. So the, in this diagram where the red arrows are, that's where the, the stair from the uh, PUD is located. And PN Hoffman was very clear when we met with them. It's really a placeholder. Um, they're actually excited about the idea of how can you coordinate um, the, the uh, Southwest Eco District Plan and that connection in, uh, with the development. So they've been very collaborative in that sense. The, the beige buildings are the overlay of the buildings from the Eco District Plan, and the two areas, the sort of yellow, is it on? Oh, there it is, the yellow, and this area is the, 
the um, basically the hill, and then the orange is the service road. And as part of, and the, between the two red lines is the the hundred foot wide view corridor that we looked at as part of the south of the southwest eco district plan. Um, in terms of grades, it's it is about eighty feet from Main to the Banneker Wall, um, and it's about well, it goes from twelve feet elevation up to thirty six feet uh, to the street edge, and then another twelve feet to the um, wall of Banneker. So it's a pretty steep incline. Um, here's a sense of where that view corridor sits um, if you're down at the waterfront, the existing waterfront. And here's a sense if you're coming down 10th, essentially this is where the corridor would end up and this is the connection to the water and this would all be new development. Um, and you know, currently the circulation will be coming down um, the median because you really can't walk on the bridge uh, going over the freeway. And so in an interim connection, we want to look at how you can connect from the median uh, to across the sidewalk and, and actually come down in that, in that throat, as we call it, um, down to the waterfront. And here is looking at the, um, the lower one is the existing service road where uh, the existing sidewalk and if the wall of the uh, service road, how it connects down to the uh, access way. So the first thing we did was wanted to test what can we fit in that 100 feet and how, how far can we get up um, from, the, from Maine to first the service road and then ultimately if it went up to Banneker. Uh, as Diane mentioned, we've been staying away from what happens at Banneker, just trying to get to the edge because there's the determination that has to occur for uh, the Banneker fountain. Um, and looking at this, trying to fit stairs and a ramp um, within that 100 feet and because of the grades, it was pretty difficult. So through the process, um, we, in discussions, it was, we looked at, actually, um, maybe it wasn't necessary to try to fit everything in that 100 feet, because um, that really is just probably too much uh, to get from both the uh, main to the service road and then the next phase. Uh, in terms of some of the ideas that have, we've, um, have been, or advice that we've got is that whatever occurs here, it really needs to be integrated with the landscape. Um, there should be areas as you're walking down to really start to get viewpoints, um, areas for rest, and that it shouldn't just be a, you know, straight, uh, kind of a, like it is now, goat trail up. It needs to sort of meld and be an experience as you come down this, uh, the hill. This, this uh, illustration just shows some of the materials, and this is where, as we start to look at what the options are, um, what the, the character might be, and a lot of it has to do with the definition of temporary and interim for these first steps, and, and quality, and you know, we'd like to see it, while well, we know it's interim and it'll have to, um, whatever happens with the Banneker may affect what's built in the short term. It should, it, it's an opportunity for having a sense of quality that starts to lay a stake on, you know, this is both the Southwest Eco connecting down to the waterfront. And so, um, you know, these are just sort of really sim simple ideas. Is it more monumental, more of a federal character? Could it be more contemporary? Maybe it's more recycled materials. Maybe that reflects the eco district. Maybe it can be reused if it's uh, reconstructed as a longer term vision for Banneker. Uh, is it more naturalistic? Um, or is there more of a district's uh, aesthetic to it? Uh, we also think there's an opportunity for integrating um, with the slopes and the stormwater collection. Um, if it's done in a I'll say low maintenance way, integrating stormwater as an accent, um, also integrating green walls to sort of soften the, the extent of the infrastructure that, may, that is built to accommodate the grades. Uh, also in terms of wayfinding, even if you get to Banneker, you, ha you kind of have to know beforehand that you're going to Banneker to get down to the, to the fish market and the, the waterfront. And so there's a lot of opportunities for, with some of the initial design for 10, or uh, programming for 10th Street, uh, in terms of you know paving signage, perhaps some lighting, um, some historic signage, some lighting, or even you know wind turbines, something that starts to lay the groundwork for the eco district story, can start to plant a flag as you move down tenth and start to make the connections to, to get down to the waterfront. So these are all um, ideas which we'd, we'd like your input and advice on, um, so that as we develop the concepts for the fall, um, we can start to integrate this. Thank you, Otto. Sorry. Um, 
And so uh, before uh, we take a moment to hear from you, I did want to uh, just go through what the Southwest Eco District Task Force said. And I, I know that five of you sit on that task force, so I appreciate you listening to this presentation again today. But also, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, there was a lot of discussion about making Banneker a destination. And just to be clear, that actually is not the point of this project of designing Banneker Park. But the thing that we can do, I think that Otto just talked about, is really focusing on drawing people to Banneker from 10th Street and doing wayfinding. So that was really important to the task force. And then relying on the existing asphalt path uh, for the ramp access, instead of trying to create a whole new um, ramp outside of the view shed. So that was some, that's something that actually we're looking at now. And then with regard to 10th Street, um, the em each emphasis uh, is appealing. Um, the hardscape for programming, the softscape for pedestrian experience, and the waterscape for the sustainable expression. And I think that we landed on a hybrid approach is probably appropriate, and I think that's what Otto just, um, just said. But that we really need to focus on that big idea that carries the design all the way through, and that's, that's sort of our challenge in, this next, in these next couple of months. Um, programming is essential, and the task force definitely reiterated that we, really, we should be setting the bar high here, that this project is in the category of Millennium Park um, of the High Line, and that we need to think big. So we're encouraged by that. Um, and then at our public meeting, um, the big comment was really, when can this get done? I think people were very excited about this. Um, and um, that uh, I think people generally feel that this is a very long um, uh, landing approach and that they'd like to break it up a little bit. So there's support for making it more episodic. Um, focusing on ground floor retail, of course, um, and restaurants are just as important at the, as the design itself of the street. Um, people like the idea of maybe thinking about this in a more contemporary way. It doesn't have to exactly mimic the National Mall. Um, it should be as green as possible. And then uh, we had the Washington Interdependence Council. Um, they were here to discuss their desire and ongoing efforts to establish a memorial to, to Benjamin Banneker. So that pretty much summarizes uh, but all of the comments we've heard so far. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, I do want to say, I know this is a lot of information. We'll be sending out, we'll send out a copy of the presentation. Um, and, I'm ha and we're certainly happy to meet at any point to talk about this. We will be back in the fall with just a concept, and that's it. We're not going to take it any further than that um, for 10th Street until uh, we start to figure out some of the funding. And then I, I forgot to mention earlier, with regard to Banneker, we'll be turning um, all of our work over to the National Park Service, who will then in, uh, start um, the NEPA process for, um, we'll come up with the preferred concept, but they'll be using um, other concepts that we've developed for, as alternatives, too. So with that, uh, are there any Discussion. questions? Questions. Just a comment about uh, Banneker. I think it's laudable to make uh, Banneker a destination. I think it, that's what it is now because you have almost a 360-degree vista. But like we talked about with the uh, Eisenhower, there's framing of the view shed, and then there's framing of the view shed. And when we go to this little slit-type view shed from the waterfront <coughs> at, at best Banneker, absent a memorial attraction to, to make Banneker a destination, it just becomes a way station. Thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan, very much. Thank you. Otto, thank you. That's the last item on our agenda. Are there other um, items that anyone wants to bring up uh, before we adjourn? I'll just say that it'd be my pleasure to bring uh, all the commissioners' the next commission meeting copies of the um, um, of our comp plan progress report, just so you could see it and see if there might be some approaches that would be uh, worthwhile to take for the federal elements. And of course, tomorrow morning we will visit uh, um, St. Elizabeth's. Um, you'll see the product of our planning work on perhaps the biggest uh, project we've had uh, in decades uh, before us. So we depart here at 9 30. Yes. And Please wear the clothing that was uh, submitted to you via email earlier yes. this week, or um, you will not be allowed on the site. Yeah, look at the restrictions and the photo ID that you need and the email that was sent to you yesterday to make sure you're you're eligible. Um, Deborah, Christine, are there any further instructions you'd like to impart while we have everybody here prior to tomorrow, for, for tomorrow? 
Deborah has just noted that, uh, excuse me, uh, Christine has just noted, she and I were talking this morning, there is forecast a tropical storm for tomorrow. So please bring appropriate rain gear. But the whole trip tomorrow would be about two hours, right? Ish. Yep. Okay. It don't, you know, don't, if bring your, if you have an HSPD or whatever you call it, badge, bring that. I, I'm sorry, I can't join you. I'll be in Detroit. Um, but bring your badge and another piece of ID just to be safe because they can get fussy. And bring your smartphone so that we can locate you once you get lost in the Coast Guard <laughs> building. Ms. White. I just wanted to um, share, I mentioned earlier, Park Score, that the Trust for Public Land is done. So if you want to visit and see where other cities ranked, it's parkscore.org on the Trust for Public Land website. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>